Thank you and welcome to the, the public uh, to this meeting, the 29th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, but a member of the com committee may leave, need to leave before the end of this session. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item five in private. This is the item on ferry services in Scotland and is for members to report back on a recent visit to Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited. Are members agreed? Yes. It's agreed. Therefore, we'll move on to agenda item three. And before I do so, I'd like to invite any members who have any relevant interest to declare them. Uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Convener. I am the Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. John. Uh, I co-convene the cross-party group on rail, for which uh, Scott Rail Alliance provide the Secretariat. Uh, Gail. I'm uh, Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Thank you. And John Finney. I'm a member of the RMT Parliamentary Group, Convener. OK, so I think that's all. Uh, yes, so this evidence session is part of a regular update from ScotRail Alliance um, and to allow the committee to, to monitor rail services issues. I'd like to welcome from ScotRail Alliance Alex Hines, the Managing Director, and Angus Tom, the Chief Operating Officer. Alex, uh, I'm going to ask you to make a short opening statement. Um, could I ask you to remember that uh, there are a lot of questions on this, so to keep it brief and not to go into too much detail on specific issues, because I'm sure committee members will want to draw you into uh, uh, questioning on those later in the meeting. So, Alex, if you'd like to start of off course. three minutes. Thank you very much. Well, good morning and thank you to the committee for inviting me here to give you our regular update on progress with Scotland's Railway since we last met in May. All of us at the ScotRail Alliance, that's Network Rail Scotland and ScotRail, are working flat out to deliver the best railway that Scotland has ever had. And I'm confident that we will do that. But this hasn't been without its challenges. Our punctuality hasn't been good enough in recent months. And I want to start by saying I'm sorry to customers for this and for the impact that this has had on their ability to go about their lives. Some of this has been outside of our control. Extreme weather events like Storm Alley have a significant impact on our ability to keep Scotland's railway open for business. But at other times we have to hold our hands up. Too often our infrastructure has let us down and when the railway doesn't work as it should, it causes significant inconvenience and disruption for those who rely on us to get to work, to see family or to visit the country. And that is why we are continuing to build upon the Donovan Review and working to understand the root causes of failures, not just fix the symptoms. Ensuring the resilience of our assets and infrastructure is another key focus, and teams are literally working around the clock on this. And in control period six, there will be an 8% increase in funding to enhance our weather-related resilience. At the heart of our work is the work that we do for the customer, and earlier this year, we took the decision to ban the use of skip-stopping. This doesn't make it any easier for us to hit our performance targets. In fact, it makes it more difficult. But it was a decision with customers at its heart, and it was a decision which has been universally welcomed by our customers. Since the last session, we've introduced three new types of trains to the network. Yes, we've had some teething problems with our brand new Hitachi electric trains, which are now operating between Edinburgh and Glasgow and Edinburgh and North Berwick. The feedback from our customers has been extremely positive. The electrification of the central belt continues apace, with Stirling, Dunblane, Allower and Shots entering the final stages. Customers can now experience our iconic intercity trains between Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and our upgraded intercity network will ultimately connect Scotland's seven cities. Investment in rural routes will see the launch of great scenic railway journeys. And other highlights to note include the improvements we are making to our timetable starting in December and carrying on over the next 12 months, which will deliver faster journeys, more seats and more services to our customers. Building on the progress already made, a pilot is underway for brand new mobile ticketing. And finally, across the Alliance, we are investing in more than 350 brand new jobs in Scotland's railway. So we're investing in trains, we're investing in our infrastructure, we are investing in our communities, and we are investing in our people. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Alex. Uh, the first question uh, of this morning's session will go to Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I want to return to the subject performance and specifically the performance improvement plans. But before perhaps uh, going there, I, I note that uh, rail its editorial last time round said Scotland shows the way, and it, it says there may be short-term pain, but the result is long-term gain. Is that uh, a proper representation of where we are at the moment, that we are experiencing some pain, and the improvement plans are perhaps not yet delivering what we require, but there will be long-term gain? I mean, there is no question that the closer working between track and train is to perceived to be a better way of running a railway system. And of course, there are lots of challenges across the UK rail network right now. And despite challenges here in Scotland, we remain uh, above uh, average for things like customer satisfaction and performance and those sorts of things. There's no question in my mind that the level of investment which is happening across the Scottish rail network is creating some operational tensions. So this year, we are investing £850 million in this 12-month period, the most on record ever in Scotland's railway. So it is true to say that some of the issues we've seen relating to performance are actually a function of the investment programme itself. And uh, what makes us very optimistic about the future is that a lot of these enhancement schemes are coming towards their final stages. We have now started to deliver the new express trains and the intercity trains, and the customer feedback on both of those products has been fantastic. And that uh, gives us uh, a great deal of hope for the future. Um, can I join the, uh, the crowd who approves of the 385s? travelled in and won this morning, as I have on a number of occasions, in my 12 to 14 hours a week on ScotRail. Uh, but on the improvement plans, what uh, are the key challenges in those plans that are at the bottom of the list? What will be done last? What's there still to do that really matters? Well, I mean, I think if you look at train service performance, um, there are a number of reasons why we're not uh, achieving our target right now. Uh, one is weather. So the weather in the last 12 months has been materially different and more extreme than is normal. Uh, even for Scotland, we've seen beasts from the east, we've seen the hottest summer on record. All of these things have challenged the resilience of our railway. The infrastructure uh, reliability, particularly in the Glasgow metropolitan area, hasn't been good enough, which is why we are investing an additional £5 million between now and March in the infrastructure in that area. The Glasgow area is very critical to the whole of the Scottish Rail network because any delay there can ripple out uh, across the network. And um, believe it or not, the delays which uh, occur in Scotland due to cross-border services have increased by 80% in the last 12 months, and that's a function of the timetable difficulties we've seen at uh, Northern and Govia Thameslink Railway. And then, of course, finally, we took the brave decision to ban skip stopping, um, which actually makes it more difficult in the short term to uh, deliver our PPM targets. So that's what's happening. Uh, we have uh, good plans to address all of those issues and combined with the investment programme, you know, we're working flat out to make sure we're delivering the service our customers expect. Well, let me just close off my questions here. I'll come back on other matters later. Um, by perhaps asking in infrastructure terms, because that's where the big increase in difficulty has come from, uh, what are the big things besides weather, which uh, presumably yeah. uh, uh, as, uh, as MD you can't directly control? What beyond that are the big uh, issues in infrastructure? Yeah. So one of the things we are uh, tackling particularly at the moment is because we're going in to deliver all this investment often overnight, what we're seeing is reliability problems shortly after we've gone in to renew or enhance the network. So we need to get much better 
at making sure we risk assess these engineering works. So uh, normally on a Thursday, we review the weekend's forthcoming engineering work. We've now strengthened those processes, so we review forthcoming engineering work earlier. And we've also set a higher threshold to our delivery teams, which say, if you don't think you can complete that work in time and hand the railway back reliably for start of service, then don't do it. And so there's lots of activity in the short term to make sure that the scale of the investment which is happening across Scotland's railway network isn't negatively affecting train service punctuality. On, uh, can we uh, just seek clarity on one comment one member would like to anyway? Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to make it absolutely clear. We've heard that skip stopping being stopped before, but it turned out it wasn't. Are you confirming that all skip stopping is now... There's no more skip stopping. With so I'm confirming we've implemented our revised policy on skip stopping, which is we've banned it apart from in a last resort. And I get the daily skip stopping report. Uh, there are some reasons why we would want to use it. So, for example, if a station is out of use because there's an incident <coughs> there or a lighting oh. failure, then clearly mm. we wouldn't call there. That counts as a fail to stop. So um, the number of skip stops is down 80% on the previous uh, year and is at record low levels. So I'm not saying we would never, ever use it, uh, but we don't use it as a mechanism to catch up to hit PPM any longer. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Richard, yours is the next question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> basically, I have to say that um, I recently watched a a debate in the House of Commons where a, an MP was really going ballistic about uh, their railway and he called on the manager to resign. I certainly am not doing that to you, Mr Hines. I think you're, you certainly are trying to cope. But I want to know, I want to know, and my constituents want to know, who's to blame for delays? Who's to blame for not getting a train? Who's to blame for uh, the situation? It's my view that you are trying to run a railway where you're ha one hand tied behind the back by network rail. Am I correct or am I wrong? Is it their, their situation that's causing your situation? Be well, truthful. Well, um, in, in Scotland, network rail and Scott Rail work together through the alliance to deliver Scotland's railway. And if we look at the primary causes of the deterioration in train service performance in the last 12 months, it is a result of infrastructure-related delays, which, of course, is the responsibility of Network Rail, and weather, which is allocated uh, in the delay attribution guide also to Network Rail. So in order for Scott Rail to do a good job, Network Rail in Scotland has to do a good job, and we're working together on that. So when you're saying you're working together, basically... Is Network Rail not a standalone and they could basically let you down and you've got no recourse and this government's got no recourse against Network Rail, or do we? Well, um, Network Rail is regulated by the Office of Rail Regulation, but on a day-to-day -day basis there's very close working between Angus's Scott Rail team and the Network Rail Scotland team, also led by me, to improve train service performance. So there's you know, a much greater level of cooperation here. So rather than blaming a party, what we're very focused on is making sure we understand why train series performance is below target and then making sure that together as an alliance we've got plans in place to fix it. So just to finish off, Network Rail is controlled by the UK government, correct? Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Right, so there are lots of follow-up questions here, um, unsurprisingly. I'm going to go to Jamie Green to start with. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, just following on from the topic that Richard Lyle is exploring, um, and can I thank uh, Mr Hines for your uh, briefing uh, to MSPs with some statistics. Can I refer to those if you have them in front of you? Uh, um, and this is about the reason why ScotRail is not delivering on its PPM. Um, in your briefing, there's a, an interesting table which states that the uh, failure to reach that PPM is either caused by Network Rail, Scott Rail, or other train operators. Would you not agree that that's a, perhaps an oversimplistic view on things? For example, within the 63% attributed to Network Rail, 
What percentage of that is a result of infrastructure failures? I'm looking on the Network Rail website, uh, and they've got a, a very helpful pie chart in terms of the delays, uh, uh, the reason why uh, operators do not reach their PPM. It, their statistics say that 37% of delays are attributed to infrastructure failures, and indeed 23% of those failures are what we call TOC on self. And that is, in other words, issues which the train operator could have prevented, such as defective trains or a lack of staff. So can you just clarify your position on this table and the statistics therein? So every delay which happens on the UK network in excess of three minutes is uh, attributed to a root cause. So whether infrastructure, train operating company, um, disturbance, for example. And the delay attribution guide sets out, does that delay belong to ScotRail or another train operating company or a, a network rail? So it is true to say that things like external, so suicides, trespass, uh, weather, that all gets put into the network rail bucket as well as what I would call genuine infrastructure asset failures. And that leads to uh, the analysis which is shown that network rail becomes um, primarily responsible for the late running of trains. What I would like to focus on is the deterioration in the last 12 months, which about half of that is from weather and half of that is from genuine infrastructure asset performance. And that's where the focus is uh, across the alliance on addressing both of those things in the short term so we can tackle these performance mm. issues. But you are right in saying that in the network rail delay bucket, it picks up things which are not related directly to sure. infrastructure so, I mean, assets. Just to clarify then, and I think it's an, an important point because it, it does form the part of, of a lot of the debate around this issue, is that the 63% attributed to network rail does encapture, capture things like weather, like external events that are outside of anyone's control. Absolutely. And as I said, looking at the figures, weather actually is only 11.7% of delays, where there, where there is delays uh, which you could have prevented as the operator, 23% more than double that and, and, and coming up not far behind the network rail infrastructure fares. Now, 37% is still 37% mm -hmm. too much, mm -hmm. I agree, uh, and those infrastructure fares should be reduced, but it's clear that the picture is not quite as bad as it's been painted in your briefing. Well, I, I think it's just a function of the way delay attribution works across the UK network. <laughs> But rather than um, focus on you know, which party is to blame, actually across the alliance, we're focused on fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and in the last 12 months, the problem has been weather and infrastructure, which is why we've got good plans in both places to, um, to, to address those. You know, at the end of the day, what customers want is a reliable train service. They're less interested in you know, who's, who's to blame. If you can fix the Scottish weather, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you um, very much. Jamie, I'm going to have to move on because there are a, a whole heap of questions taking up. Maureen. Yeah, just to follow uh, up on that point, Mr Hines, um, is there a debate within the industry about delay attribution? Because it strikes me that this talk and FOC, in case it comes out the wrong way, um, is not, it's not refined enough to be to actually say to the public what it's about. So, for example, you know, I doubt that the passengers are going to be that bothered if the delay is due to network upgrade and, and as a result they'll get better trains and a better service than if it's a delay for something else. So it strikes me that this delay attribution is really not sophisticated enough to reflect that many of the delays might be due to upgrades, but that's not reflected in, in how it comes out. I mean, obviously, it's our job to make sure we're upgrading the network to um, support a high level of reliability, and I'll explain what we're doing about that. I mean, the delay attribution system has hundreds of delay codes. It's been in existence for, um, you know, about 25 years now, and it's a, a frequent topic of debate in the UK rail industry. Um, what we do across the alliance is every month we publish our PPM um, statistics and we explain to our customers, you know, what were the primary causes uh, of delays. So, for example, in the last period we published and um, we hit a PPM target of 81.8%. 
um, four percent of that um, PPM loss, as we call it, was directly due to Storm Alley, and that's a great example of this more extreme weather which we're seeing. So we're seeing more storms, we're seeing more severe severe storm conditions, and those storms are becoming more impactful. And as you might imagine, we've done a full lessons learned on Storm Alley, and every tree which fell onto the railway, which disrupted our network, came from outside the railway boundary. Um, so all the good work we're doing at the moment to uh, improve vegetation management within the railway boundary actually wouldn't have helped us there. Um, so, you know, my view is we could try and reform the delay attribution system across the UK, um, but, um, you know, that, that's a job for us, others. Our job is to make sure that the customers of Scotland's railway get a reliable service as soon as we possibly can. Maureen, is that you? Okay, uh, Gail. Yeah, really quickly. Good morning, panel. Um, Alex, if a Scotrail train is delayed to wait for other passengers from a train operated by another operator that can't make progress because of weather, how is that delay attributed in your statistics? Yeah. And don't you think that in 2018 it's a little bit ridiculous that a train can't make progress up a hill because of leaves on the line? So, um, essentially, the delay attribution system tries to identify the primary cause of delay. Um, and clearly, sometimes that's not always possible. You know, and in ev events here in Scotland can be due to a late departure from Birmingham New Street. You know, it's a UK-wide network. So, um, I think um, in the interest of being able to see the woods from the trees, what we're focused on at the moment is uh, infrastructure-related failures, particularly in the Glasgow metropolitan area. Not because Glasgow is more important than anywhere else, but the Glasgow network uh, uh, affects the performance of the whole of Scotland's railway and weather, as I discussed. I think what you're referring to are the LNER services uh, between Inverness and, and London. So, um, as you know, autumn creates many challenges for us. Um, this autumn, which was a Donovan review recommendation, uh, our autumn plan went to the ScotRail Alliance board. It was our biggest ever autumn plan. We invested £13 million um, in our autumn plan. We run what's called railhead treatment trains across the network, and the number of miles run by those railhead treatment trains were up 60% on the previous autumn. We had more leaf fall teams. We had more equipment fitted to the track, which spreads this glue-like sandy material to enable the trains to get a get better traction but um, what we need to do is make sure we review this autumn's performance which actually from an autumn perspective has gone relatively well to see whether we can do more working with LNER and on the infrastructure to avoid that happening uh, briefly going to bring in John Finney and then I have a question myself John Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, Mr Hines, it's, it's from the briefing that uh, you provided to us, uh, and it's a particular phrase that relates to this, or, or maybe you'll tell it doesn't relate to this, and it's the phrase, our integrated control works closely with signallers and other operators to ensure we make decisions for the benefit of the majority of passengers when it comes to managing and regulating services in Scotland. Can you maybe expand a little bit more on that? Is that a head count? There's... 30 folk in that train, there's 200 in that, so the 200 will always get preference? So, not, not necessarily. So, um, in Scotland, we have a single control centre for the whole of Scotland, and the control centre is part of the alliance. So, the control centre uh, is responsible for managing the network rail bits of the system and the Scott rail bits of the system. That's unique in the UK. We, we think it's better. It's one reason why we have a lower delay per incident here in Scotland than in other parts of the network and enables quicker decision making. Um, the signallers um, will comply with what's called regulation statements. And so uh, if it's a class one train, a fast train, uh, clearly they're given priority because you don't want them stuck behind class two trains, which tend to be stopping trains. So those regulation decisions which are made by signallers are made in the interests of the overall system. 
and one of the things the control centre does particularly uh, and particularly at the moment since May is to look beyond Scotland to see what are those cross-border trains which are coming to us up the East Coast Main Line and the West Coast Main Line to make sure any late running uh, into cities don't adversely impact um, uh, the Scott Rail services or the services in, on the Scottish Rail network. And as I said earlier on, the delays created by these cross-border services are up uh, 80% in the last 12 months, given performance problems south of the border. So our control centre is having to work harder to try and mitigate the impact on Scottish Rail services right now. But, but in effect, does that mean you can or would give preference to a Scott Rail train? So the signallers will regulate for PPM. So they will do the best thing for every train operating company and freight operating company in Scotland. Um, so they won't give priority to a particular company or not. What they will give priority to is the overall reliability of the system. And that includes sleeper, ScotRail, LNER, TransPennine, Virgin Trains, freight operating companies. So they, in real time, are looking at the whole picture and making decisions in the best interests of the overall system. Must be a very complicated calculation, that. It certainly is. And we have a dedicated team in the control centre working 24-7, uh, managing that while we're sat in here. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, so I, I too, like... I'm sure all the committee members read your briefing uh, note uh, to MSPs <laughs> regarding uh, the problems faced in Scotland's railways uh, carefully. And, and a lot of it, uh, as, as has been alluded to, and as you indeed have alluded to at the committee today, uh, are pointed in the direction of network rail. I just wondered uh, why there wasn't a representative of network rail here as part of the Alliance group to, to answer some of those questions, because uh, it would have seemed to me uh, that might have been useful. So the briefing uh, is designed to explain the facts around why we're not hitting our punctuality targets. So they're not directed at any one party to blame. What they're directed on is making sure that the facts are clear as to what's going on with respect to train series punctuality. So the whole purpose of the Scott Rail Alliance is that ScotRail and Network Rail work together to deliver Scotland's railway. So I'm the Managing Director of Network Rail Scotland. I'm also the Managing Director of ScotRail. I happen to be a Network Rail employee from a pay and rations perspective, and Angus is the Chief Operating Officer of ScotRail. And together, we work together to deliver the best for Scotland's railway. That is the whole purpose of the Alliance. Um, Abellio's bid set out a deep alliance to deliver Scotland's railway because, like most people, we believe this is the best way to run a railway for Scotland. Uh, and I take that point and I just make the observation that sometimes if, if people are going to uh, be asked questions on specific things, it, it, although I'm sure you're very competent in answering all the questions, sometimes it's helpful to have members of, of say, Network Rail present. And I, I'm just going to leave that co comment hanging there, if I move, may, and move on to the next question, which is from Colin. Thanks very much, Convener, uh, and good morning to the panel. Uh, Scott Rail's performance is no below breach level, uh, and you have the worst performance since the franchise began. Have Abelio been given any penalties for this failure uh, in performance, or, or have you simply been given a waiver um, to avoid hitting your performance targets until June next year? Well, Scott Rail's performance is not beneath the breach level. Um, Scottish Government has decided to grant a temporary uh, waiver on the breach level in the franchise agreement, uh, recognising that the causes of the increase in delays in the last 12 months are as a result of infrastructure, weather and the impact of cross-border operations on Scotland's railway, i.e. all of those things outside the direct control of ScotRail. But believe you me, Transport Scotland and Scottish Government are quite rightly holding us to account on making sure we deliver the performance improvement that our customers expect to see. But just to be clear, had you not been given that waiver by the Scottish Government, your performance figures are below what would be classed as breach level? 
That is correct. Yeah. Uh, and you touch on um, the issues around the reasons for that, and I think the debates already been had on the fact that, that, that most of the, um, in fact, all of uh, the extreme weather um, reasons are attributed entirely to um, network rail when it comes to those figures. But one of the reasons that you haven't mentioned, and it is in your application for that waiver, uh, one of the reasons for you failing to hit your performance targets is the fact that you are now uh, avoiding skipping stops. Do you not think that the public and passengers will find it absolutely remarkable that the reason, and one of the reasons you're given for failing to hit your performance targets is the fact that you're now doing your job in terms of stopping at all the stations you're supposed to? Well, skip stopping is just one of the measures that control centres across the UK use to restore train service to timetable after an incident happens. Um, we took the decision to ban it, uh, except in a last resort. Um, not everyone chooses to do that. We chose to do that, and I think we can see that in the level of our customer complaints. What that means is it takes us longer to respond to an incident. So we think it takes us 25% longer to recover from an incident uh, than prior to the use of skip stopping. Um, and uh, we believe it's the right thing to do. You know, PPM is just one measure of the quality of the train service. And um, last period, it was interesting to see that although our PPM was lower than the same period 12 months before, actually customer complaints were a lot better. So we believe that whilst this is difficult for our PPM statistics, it's actually the best thing to do for the customer, which is why we did it. I think customers will think stopping at the station they're waiting at is a good thing for a rail company to do. Uh, I just find it remarkable that, that that is now an excuse for not hitting your performance targets, which does seem to suggest to the committee that when the franchise bid was made, you built in to that hitting your performance targets on the basis of missing stops, because presumably that is the, 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 the logical conclusion to the fact that if you're not missing stops anymore, that's a reason for not hitting your performance targets. So, failure to stops um, have occurred on Scotland's railway for many, many years, way back into the previous franchise. Um, in the autumn of last year, um, I think it's fair to say we overused fail to stops, uh, which is why we took the policy decision to ban it. Okay, so, so, so now that we are effectively banning um, skip stopping, when do you perceive you will meet your contractual performance targets because the ORR seem to suggest it will have to wait until 2022. Is that the case? Well, clearly the thing to do is to get to 92.5% PPM moving annual average as soon as possible. Um, given that we are trying to move a moving annual average, uh, you know, there is a, um, a mathematical uh, limit on how much, uh, how quickly we can reach that. 92.5% um, PPM MAA is a very challenging target. Scotland's Railway has never got to that level and stayed there, which is why we're working flat out to get there as soon as we can. As soon as you can, but the ORRC, it won't be until 2022. Is that accurate? Or if it's not, when will you meet your performance well, targets? Our, our aspiration is to get there as soon as we possibly can. That's our target. Okay. Finally, you'll be pleased to know that. Can I ask what engagement you've had with um, Scottish Government over uh, your failure to hit those performance targets? And have ministers given any indication that they expect to end the Obelio Scotrail contract at the first expiry date on the 31st of March 2022, or do they intend to let that continue until 2025? <coughs> So uh, we sit down and review the performance of Scotland's Railway every month uh, with officials at Transport Scotland and I've recently met with the Cabinet Secretary on the issue of train service performance and Scottish Government are quite rightly holding us to account on the delivery of better train service performance. Um, I think you will find Scottish Government are on the record uh, to explain that their expectation is the franchise would run full term. Right now, the focus for the ScotRail Alliance is delivering improved service to customers, delivering the December timetable change and these new fleets of trains to deliver the faster journeys, the more seats and more services, which we promise to our customers.
Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, which is Jamie Green. And Jamie, you tried to catch my eye during uh, an exchange there. I'll let you bring it in if there's something within this question. Th Jamie. Thanks, Convener. It's all, it's all linked together. It just falls on from Mr. Smith's uh, line of uh, questioning. Um, do, do you know, uh, could I ask, uh, do you know why the year five payments to Belly have been brought forward? Or is that a question for the government? Um, can you just clarify what your question yes, is? Yes, accelerated franchise payments. Uh, my understanding is that these payments that are due to Bellio have been brought forward by the government uh, and Transport Scotland have paid these earlier than the year in which they're due. Is that something you're aware of? So, um, I mean, Bellio Scott Rail hasn't received any money from the Scottish taxpayer that it's not already due. Uh, and clearly this is a big commercial contract and those commercial discussions happen all of the time. So, um, if you have a specific question, perhaps we can follow that up. After so you said money that's not due, but uh, it, is it due now? Is it the case that the money is due down the line, but it's been paid earlier? Is that my understanding of what's been reported? Um, well, I mean, I think this is a complex commercial contract where those commercial negotiations happen all the time, but it's not true to say that Abellio Scott Rail has had a single penny from Scottish Government, which it's not due. So. Okay, that, that, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and, and in your previous answer, you also mentioned uh, that PPM is not the only way of, of monitoring yep. performance. There are others. If I could point to two others. One is the Squire yep. Fund, uh, which is an important part of your, your metrics. Uh, and uh, the other is around complaints. Uh, I'll start with complaints first, because you mentioned it in your answer to Colin Smith. Uh, you, you seem to be pleased with, with, with progress on that. Uh, you may have read uh, today's news uh, and, and the latest WITCH report that came out uh, looking at how complaints are handled by train operators in the UK. And the, the reality is that 40% of people who complain to ScotRail do not think that they, their complaint was handled politely. And 57% of people who complain to ScotRail have a more negative view on the company after complaining. Is that acceptable to ScotRail? So if I take Squire first before coming on to uh, customer complaints. So um, I'm pleased to say that Squire is moving in the right direction. We're making some very real progress in this area. And you will have seen for the last quarterly results, there was a 10% improvement in our Squire performance. Uh, the three main uh, causes of uh, also the three areas we need to tackle next are the surfaces of car parks, uh, ticket office closures and on-train ticket inspection. And uh, we've got good plans in place for all of those things. And uh, Angus personally leads uh, our Squire improvement plan. So, uh, Angus, do you just want to explain to the committee what else we're doing here in this area? So um, last time we met in May, since then we have introduced a new way of making sure that we tackle some of the problems that are identified through the, the Squire regime. So when we met last time there was 11 areas that were identified as not achieving or not improving in a way that was uh, satisfactory for our customer. So out of 11 areas, 10 of them are all heading in the right direction, which is um, Alex's point about the 10% the improvement. And there's one area where we're still um, looking to do further plans on, which is around our on-train ticket inspection, which is around some of the mechanical software problems we're having with some of the equipment on board our train that our, our ticket examiners do, uh, use. I personally lead um, working groups now looking at how we can um, improve service quality for our customer and making sure we make the best of some of the funds that are available. So as Alex touched on, there's now, um, well that, it's actually not from the SARA fund, but there's £5 million worth of investment going into car parks around our stations, which our customers will welcome. And there's £2 million being spent on improving CCTV to improve security at stations. So it's a more modern um, CCTV system that we're putting in place. So some of the, kind of the examples that we're, um, we're doing. And can, just on Squire, before uh, Mr Hines comes, comes back with my uh, uh, question around um, customer complaints. Um, it, my understanding is there are over four million pounds in the Squire pot at the moment. Is that correct? I couldn't. I couldn't give you an exact figure. Of okay. What uh, in, in, in answer to a recent uh, parliamentary question, that's the number I've got. But we can, we can check that for the record. Um, how do we ensure that that money, which is in effect a fine for not not meeting your your, your uh, performance metrics, uh, will be used to do things that will improve the customer experience? and not be used to do things that you should be doing anyway? So when we uh, make an application and we work with our colleagues in Transport Scotland to uh, use that money for something that might in, uh, benefit or improve uh, something for the customer, be it on train or a station or a car park, we have to write an investment paper, which we then submit to our board, the Abellio board, and Transport Scotland um, have sight of and feel uh, 
view of what we actually spend that money on. And it is, the money is used for improving things that um, have been identifi identified through the service quality regime as needing improvement, such, such as we might put more station shelters in, we might improve seating at certain locations. I think in the Edinburgh Glasgow route, you might have seen some of the stations that have had improved waiting areas and have you know, had some work and, and some money spent on them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any money spent from the Squire Fund is genuinely additive to what was in the investment programme anyway, so it is genuinely extra. And clearly, um, the expenditure requires Transport Scotland Authority, so um, they make sure that that's the case. Uh, on complaints, so I'm familiar with the publication by which this morning, and we will review that report and see what lessons we can learn to further improve our complaints performance. Um, in ScotRail, we set ourselves the target of responding to complaints uh, within one week rather than the industry standard of four weeks and our performance against those um, targets are, are good um, but I'm sure there's always things that we can learn to continually improve our complaints handling process. Um, there are a few questions that came up during the course of that so I'm going to take Mike Rumbles first and then Richard Lark. Thank you very much convener. Um, in answer, Alex, um, in answer to your question, to a question from Jamie Green, when you were asked had you received any taxpayers' money in advance of when it was supposed to be due, you gave what I thought at first sight was a clear answer. You actually said that you hadn't received a penny of taxpayers' money that wasn't due. The, the real question is, have you received it before it was due? That's the question I'd like answered. So, um, I think these... You know, this is a big commercial contract, and the commercial contract. It's a simple question. Have, have being... you received money that was due to you before you actually before it's due? Um, so, the, the, the subsidy payments, which between ScotRail and Transport Scotland, are adjusted all the time to reflect changes in the contract. And so, is so that a yes? It's, it's, sorry, is that a yes that you have received money, taxpayers' money, before it was due? I mean, I think um, the answer to the question is that these commercial discussions happen all the time, and that includes the phasing of subsidy. But it's not true to say that Scott Rail's received anything that it hasn't been uh, due under the terms of the franchise agreement. On time. That's the, this is a very important question. You, you seem to be evading answering this question, if I may say so, on the grounds of commercial uh, confidentiality. It's a very simple question. Uh, Jamie Green tried to pursue it and didn't, from my perspective, get a, a clear answer. I'm trying to pursue this. So just that we get it clear, has ScotRail received taxpayers' money that it is due, but before it is due? Yes or no? So we have had discussions with Scottish Government around the phasing of subsidy payments, yes. So you have received it before? I'm, uh, no. Alex, I, th I, think you've, I think you're going to have to answer the question because you're being pushed quite clearly on this. Yes. There must be a date that the subsidy is normally paid. That would be the due date. What you're being asked, and have been asked by two committee members, <coughs> is have you received that money in advance of the due date? Uh, to me, it's a simple yes or no answer. And, and, and it would be helpful, I think, to, to end this line of question and move on. But we can't do it until you give me a yes or no answer. So have you received a payment in advance of the due date? So it's true to say that ScotRail has received some revenue support payments, which it is contractually due from April uh, next year in advance of April next year. But that does not change the... Uh, net amount of taxpayer subsidy to the franchise and it's worth saying that these commercial discussions happen all the time between ScotRail and Scottish Government and those changes are just one of the changes we discuss at regular intervals with uh, Transport Scotland officials. Okay, so, so I think the simple answer is yes, they've been paid in advance, but there's no difference to the overall total that's being paid. Richard, do you want to, to, to come yeah, in? Yeah, I was, I was, I going, to, to I was going to say that. It doesn't matter if you're owed X amount of money and you, and you get it at a certain date, <coughs> as long as you don't get more than X amount of money. What's the problem? Anyway, I want to go on to some of the things that... Uh, Hold I, on, I, I Richard, thought... Richard, sorry. I want uh, uh, 
John Finney wants to ask particularly on this question. If, you, if you're on this question of payment dates, happy to let you go forward. Otherwise, I'd like to bring John Finney in. No, I'm on a separate other OK, question. so can I bring John Finney in first and then come back to you, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Kavita. <clears throat> Mr Hines, it was, it was around um, replies to both my, well, my three colleagues there and your use of the word franchise on some occasions and contract and others. Are, are, are these words interchangeable? Are they one and the same? Because you talked about changes to contract. What, what, what so, changes would be so uh, the, undertaken to the contract? The, um, the contract is called the franchise agreement, which is a big document mm. that thick, which contains hundreds and hundreds of pages around the rights and the, the obligations of the franchisee and Transport Scotland. And it is managed in a dynamic way. So, for example, if we don't meet commitments, we have to make payments to Transport Scotland. The late delivery of the Hitachi trains are a good example of that. Sometimes Scottish Government chooses to reinvest those payments into the Scottish Rail Network. So these commercial negotiations are happening all of the time on a real-time basis. And the purpose of it is to make sure we're delivering you know, good services to the passengers of ScotRail, but also a good deal for the Scottish taxpayer as well. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the phrase Scottish taxpayer, and I understand that you'll want to, to use the term commercial and confidence, but of course this is taxpayers' money. And the, <coughs> excuse me, and the obligation on this committee <coughs> excuse me, is to scrutinise the use of that public yep. money. What substantive changes to contract have taken place then? So that would have financial implications. The, I mean, the largest uh, change which is made to the franchise agreement since it came into force on the 1st <laughs> of April 2015 is our revol revolution in rail timetable. So the timetable benefits which Scottish rail customers will see in the next 12 months are greater than that at the time of the bid. And that was a further improvement to the benefits that uh, Scottish Rail customers will see. That was a big change to the franchise agreement. Uh, it requires an increase in net subsidy. And that's another good example of those commercial <coughs> changes we make to the franchise agreement on an ongoing basis. And we do that to make sure that we um, reflect the latest situation. Uh, this is a dynamic contract. It was signed in 2014, but obviously the world looks a bit different now. And both parties are continually um, working together to deliver the best outcome for Scottish Rail customers and taxpayers. So, you know, these discussions are happening all of the time. I, I don't recognise this commercial and confidence. This is taxpayer money. Uh, can you direct members to where we would find um, a, a note of all the contract changes? For instance, it, clearly everyone wants an enhancement to the yeah. timetable. Wh where would we find that, Mr Hines? So my understanding is the franchise agreement and any franchise variations are available on the public register, okay. albeit in redacted form if those discussions are commercially confidential. But how are they commercially confidential? You're a sole provider. Well, because if um, the change which we agree with Scottish Government requires us to spend money with a third party, for example, we don't necessarily want the supplier knowing how much money we've got to spend because, miraculously, that would be the cost that they quote us. So there is genuine commercial confidentiality here. But if, if you... <laughs> I'm sorry if to... Can, uh, one further one. Can, one further one, and then well, I must Mr. go to Richard Lyle, otherwise he, he, he Mr. Hines, may explode. If you're, if you're buying an additional service from someone, um, surely just say that's going to cost us X, give us X more. Your inference is that it's X plus something that you're getting. Well, I mean, I think if... if, if um, you know, we've got some big third-party suppliers and we don't necessarily want the supply chain to know what our budgets are. And so sometimes that detail is redacted from the franchise agreement between ScotRail and Transport Scotland to make sure we can deliver the very best deal for passengers and taxpayers. So, um, you know, the franchise agreements for every train operating company across the UK are publicly available, but some key clauses on an exceptional basis are redacted to protect commercial confidentiality. Okay, okay, thank you. So I, I'm going to go to Richard Lyle for a follow-up on, on square perform. Uh, yeah, but I, th I think I also have to clarify, if you, if you have an overdraft with a bank, say, 
and you draw on that overdraft, but don't go over your overdraft. Is that not similar to what this is? You are allowed X amount of money for the government. You may draw on that at any time. Is that no similar? Yes or no? No, it's not. Well, <laughs> there's only two sources of funding from the railway. That's yeah. the fare box from customers yeah. and the subsidy payments from Scottish Government. Yeah. And, um, you know, both of those things change over time. Yeah. But you can, you can draw on that subsidy at any time, as long as you don't go over the subsidy. Well... OK, I'll leave that. And, uh, thing is, Richard, I think... Yeah, I'll move on to my question. Thank please. you. Um, right, so all the performance targets you have, um, you're a train operator, not a car park attendant, uh, my view. You know, um, do you believe that all the performance targets you've got, that some should be reviewed and some are really not necessary? Well, um, Squire is the toughest service quality regime in existence uh, in any franchise agreement across the UK. Uh, we signed up to it. It's our job to meet it. And Squire is designed to measure those things which uh, the customer sees, irrespective of who's responsible for uh, delivering it. So, you know, the stations and the car parks are primarily owned by Network Rail. They're leased by ScotRail. And actually, this car park resurfacing work we're doing at the moment between now and the end of March to specifically tackle these service quality areas are actually being funded by Network Rail. So, um, Angus, I don't know whether you've got any follow-up on that. Um, so I think I mean, Alex has made, covered main, most of the main points around the service quality, but it is a tough regime. But as Alex said, we have committed that we would, you know, um, abide by that regime and make sure that we improve things for our, our customers. So I mean, the, the service quality regime is about what the customer sees, feels when they either go on our station or on our trains, and it is about improving so the, that for the customer. So there's a car park uh, at near Belsall train station, which is not immediately right beside the station, but it is, it is yours. So you're responsible for it. So we, I'm, I am absolutely parking that comment because I, I don't think that's along the line of the question that we agreed. And, and, and I'm going Some to... Some car parts are well away from the station. Mr Lyle, Mr, for it. Mr. Lyle, Mr. Lyle, Mr. Lyle, please, I am moving on <coughs> to the next question, which is John Mason's. John. Uh, thanks, Convener. Slightly uh, different direction uh, at this point. Um, you mentioned in your opening marks the Class 385 rolling stock, uh, which I think uh, Mr Stevenson enjoys. Um, can you give us an update on how that's going forward? I think there were a few hiccups in October, but uh, where we are with that? Yeah, so we have ten trains in service, four of them uh, operating between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and one of them operating between Edinburgh and North Berwick. Uh, we have uh, 20 trains accepted by ScotRail, ready for service, and at the moment we are working with Hitachi to get sufficient numbers of the Class 385 rolling stock into Scotland and accepted for use for the December timetable change, where the requirement uh, jumps up to around 30 trains. Um, we have had some teething problems uh, with uh, the new rolling stock. This is not unusual for the introduction of new trains. Um, we're working with Hitachi to iron out those teething issues. Um, the train is operating um, pretty reliably, and um, I, th I think this train will prove to be a fantastic investment by a Bellio, 475 million uh, of investment. And uh, the feedback we've had from our customers around the Hitachi train, which we brand as Express, has been absolutely superb. And we're looking forward to giving customers across uh, the central belt of Scotland uh, a taste of that new product. Right, so if I got that correct, there's 10 in use, there's 20 accepted, and there's 30 needed. Correct. Is that right? Um, and, and is it 30 that that's what we're going to get eventually? No, we're buying 70 of we're these trains. We're buying 70, sorry. Yes. Right. So we need 30 for the December timetable next month. Right. That will see us... Uh, and are we going to have 30 for next month? Yes. Um, we will deliver a full Hitachi Edinburgh Glasgow service from next month. We will also operate the Hitachi trains between um, the Central Belt and Alloa. 
we will also use the Hitachi trains to operate a new service between Edinburgh and Glasgow via Falkirk Grahamston. The 365s, the so-called happy trains, they go on to the Dunblanes and then we continue to work with Hitachi to make sure we've got all 70 trains in service by next May, which is the next timetable change which will deliver even more services, more seats and faster journeys for the customers of Scotland's Railway. Okay. And I think one of the aims of these trains was to reduce the Edinburgh-Glasgow journey time to 42 minutes. Can you give us an update on how that's going? Yep. So we already deliver a journey time of 44 minutes today, exploiting the potential of the electric trains. That's down from 52 minutes when we had the diesel operation. Um, from December, we start to deliver some 42-minute journey times between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, that's a 20% reduction in the journey time between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And um, next May, we will operate even more services at 42-minute journey time, exploiting the fact that we've got more of these uh, Hitachi trains and less diesel trains on the network, which, as we know, are slower to accelerate uh, and brake. And it remains my aspiration that I would like to get journey times between Edinburgh and Glasgow down to 39 minutes to exploit the uh, very quick performance of this train. So Network Rail colleagues are seeing what incremental infrastructure work would be required to uh, enable that to happen in the future. And is it the intention that they'll all be 42, or will it always be the case that some will stop more often and therefore will be longer than 42? Yeah, I mean, certainly in the peak where we make more stops to um, prioritise capacity and frequency, and sometimes on later night services we stop more often, but the, 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 the standard service pattern will be 42 minutes wherever possible. Okay, thank you. Peter, you wanted to come in. Just a, just a small point, just to clarify, uh, Alex, you said you were investing £475 million in these new trains, is that correct? Correct. And that's for 70 trains? That, 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 nothing that, to do with infrastructure, that's just the actual it's, rolling it's, stock it's, as such? It's, it's £475 million on the new fleet, so that's the Hitachi, the Intercity, plus, of course, the refurbishment of all the trains which we're keeping within uh, Scotland, which are being refurbished to an as-new standard. Oh, so that includes the 125s that are Correct. Aberdeen, yeah. uh, Edinburgh route as well? Correct. OK, thank yeah. you. Uh, the next question, then, is from Maureen. Maureen. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it must have been between 2011 and 2014 that I got the agreement of government to upgrade the trains from the central belt to Aberdeen and Inverness, that they be um, four or five coaches and um, slightly more comfortable for um, such long journeys. We're coming to the end of 2018 and we're still not there yet. So can you provide an update on the rollout of the high speed trains between the Central Belt and Aberdeen and Inverness? Yes, of course. So since October, we've been operating the first intercity service between Aberdeen and Edinburgh and customers have started to benefit from the four carriage intercity trains. We're getting 26 of these intercity trains, both four and five car uh, carriages. So that's a three car diesel train to a four or five car intercity train. Um, a bit like Express, the customer feedback we've had on that product has been exceptional and we're really excited about giving customers more of those intercity services as we recreate this uh, intercity network for Scotland across the seven cities. Um, for the December timetable change, so next month, uh, we will op be operating 10 uh, services operated by the high-speed train. Um, because of delays uh, by Wabtec with the heavy overhaul of this train, we will be operating some HSTs in what we're calling classic uh, mode, i.e. pre-refurbished. These are still quality trains. So customers are already experienced between Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and customers will start to see more of these high-speed trains from the 9th of December. And between now and the end of next year, we will roll more of the uh, high-speed trains out and we'll be refurbishing most of those uh, well, all of those trains, such that they're all done by the end of next year. So there are ten at the moment, or nine at the moment. So well, how many will there be in total when so, you... So there's one in service at the moment, ten for next month, and 26 ultimately, and they will be all refurbished to an intercity standard by the end of next year. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Mike. Yes. Um, the unrefurbished high-speed trains will deposit toilet waste directly onto the tracks, um, despite your agreement uh, with rail workers not to do this. And, of course, it impacts on them most of all. On the 1st of November, the First Minister said in the Chamber, in response to a question from myself, that, and I quote, this is not a practice that we support, and it is important that ScotRail works to resolve the situation as quickly as possible. <laughs> so when is the situation going to be resolved? So um, we agree we don't support this practice. Um, it's not a practice we would like to see more of, but because of the delays to uh, the refurbishment of the intercity trains, we've been forced into this situation whereby we have to operate the high-speed trains in what we call classic mode. So, as you might imagine, we've had extensive discussions uh, with our trade union colleagues and indeed our workforce on how we manage the issues that this will present. Uh, we have some investment planned which we will deliver as soon as possible to try and mitigate the impact of uh, the fact that these trains aren't fitted with closed emission toilets. That includes a modification to the rolling stock which will limit where and when that effluent is discharged to the track and we will continue to work with our workforce based on the track as well to make sure that any risks are being managed. The good news is that in Scotland, generally, uh, we don't allow track workers trackside when trains are running, so uh, risk is minimised there. And uh, we've set ourselves the deadline of working with our trade union partners to come up with a package of measures um, by the end of this month. Sorry, that's, that's the deadline to come up with the ideas, the package. Yeah. My question really is, what's the deadline to getting rid of this practice, which you really shouldn't have in the 21st century? What, what is the timescale for, for you to be able to say, by this date, it will be, this, will, this will not be happening? So, at the moment, we're expecting all of the intercity trains to be refurbished, and that includes the fitment of the closed emission toilets by the end of next year. But as an interim measure, we're going to invest in the uh, classic high-speed trains to um, reduce the problem. We can fit um, technology to the train which limits where and when mm -hmm. we can issue the effluent to the track. When do you think that will be done, then? So, um, probably in the early new year, but we're still in discussions with our trade union partners and the workforce to find a solution to this difficult problem um, to make sure um, no one's exposed to any of the issues faced by the use of this rolling stock, which is used today here in Scotland. It's not a new thing for Scotland's railway. Um, we'd rather not be here, but we're working with our partners in the trade unions to uh, find a way through this. Okay. Can, I, can I just ask a, a, a follow-up question on that? Is, is that this discharging of, of human waste onto the rail tracks, uh, it, which I think you describe, describe as the classic mode, I'm not sure that's the way I'd look at it, but how are you going to assure people in Scotland, a lot of whom are on private water supplies, that human waste isn't being dropped onto the track close to where the water is that could affect their drinking uh, water in their houses. I, I mean, I have to say, I've, I find it very odd. I mean, it's completely against the law, for example, a farmer to drive down the road uh, carrying cattle and for that waste to be discharged on the road or anywhere else, for that matter, has to be taken back to the farm and disposed of properly. So. I don't understand how we're in this situation. Surely you knew when you put the trains on the track this was going to be a problem. And could you please then assure me that it's not going to get anywhere near human water supplies and you can absolutely assure the public that that's going to be the case, Alex? Well, clearly there's no risk to water supplies. I mean, this is a practice which is currently in use across the UK rail network, including here in Scotland today. So we will manage any risks just like we do today. And there's nothing we would do to compromise the quality of water supply. Um, as you know, Plan A was to have the refurbished high-speed trains in service, which includes the fitment of retention tanks to the toilets. We're not in that situation. Um, um, we, we don't want to be in this situation, so we'll need to make sure that we manage any risks as best we can, and those are what we're discussing with our workforce. OK, well, I'll just, I'll just make the point that if, if human waste is, is dropped on the track and you get rain, 
that human waste will break down, seep through yeah. the, uh, the a ballast that's on the track and could go into human water supplies. I mean, there are, there are very strict regulations regarding that. So I'm not sure how you can make that assurance, but... but well, this is, a, this is a risk which we manage today, and it's our job to make sure that that risk gets no worse as a result of this. OK. Peter, no worse. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think I think this is this is a, a kind of a, a fairly shocking situation that we're in. As I understand it, from, as as of next month, you will be running ten of these trains between Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and only one of them, only one of the ten, will be will be refurbished. Nine will be still, as you call, call it, the classic mode, which I would use another word to describe it. But is that correct? Only one of the ten that will be running next month will will be upgraded. So that's our expectation, yes. We are expecting to have a second refurbished train here in Scotland, uh, but we may use that to continue driver and conductor training and maintenance training. Mm. Um, these trains have recently come out of service on Great Western Railway. They were refurbished relatively recently. You know, customers will be used to the look and feel of these trains already operating between Aberdeen and Inverness on cross-border services. So um, what our customers tell us that they would prefer a classic HST over a 170. And so, yes, it wasn't our original plan, but uh, I firmly believe that customers will regard this as an uplift in the level of quality of provision of rail services. But this is far from what we were promised. <coughs> you know, we, we were promised that these trains, when they came into service, every one of them would be refurbished before they, they went on that on that route. And, and you've, you've absolutely failed to deliver on that. And, you know, I, this refurbishment, you, you knew this was coming down the track a long time ago. Why are we so far behind with the refurbishing these trains? Well, essentially because the contract we entered into with Angel Trains, who actually own the trains, they've not delivered. Uh, and the root cause of that problem is that Wabtec, the company who are doing the refurbishment of these trains on behalf of Angel Trains, uh, have really struggled with this refurbishment programme and that's left us uh, in the situation that we're in. Angus, I don't know whether it's worth mm. adding anything yeah, else on the... Wabtec of struggle to maintain staffing levels at the, what they required for the refurbishment programme. There's been technical difficulties that they've had to overcome with fitting some of the new and upgraded equipment we want on the train. Um, and they're, you know, they've, they've started to get uh, through these problems and the are making inroads, but they, are, they have struggled to deliver uh, on time. Um, and you know, we are holding Wabtec and Angel trains uh, to account on this to make sure that you know, they, they recover this as quickly as they can. And um, we've had to take the, the, the unfortunate uh, decision to introduce these um, and the, what we call the classic, or the as is kind of. Um, and and, and Western. have you any have you any f a financial a recompense coming because of the, f the failure of this Wabtec, did you call it, to, to refurbish these trains? So in the contract we have, and in the franchise agreement we have with uh, the government and Transport Scotland, it, we have obligations to deliver trains by certain times. If we don't hit those obligations uh, on the time that we say to do, then yes, there is penalties for, tra uh, for a Belio Scott Rail um, for not meeting the um, their obligation. But there's penalties on you and Abelio, but is there, is there other penalties that you can pass back to Wabtec? That, that our, our contracts, the, yes, there is mechanisms through the different contracts for us to try and, uh, or us, for us to hold Wabtec and uh, Angel Trains to account. Okay. Yeah. Jamie Green, and then move on to the next question, which will be Richard Lyle. Th thanks, Convener. I, I, I mean, just following on from this line, line of questioning, I, I'm sure the, the panel understands the frustration felt by passengers, uh, uh, specifically on Aberdeen and Inverness routes, when they see over £1.3 billion has been spent on the central belt improvements, delivering spanking new 385 carriages and an improved journey time, uh, only to discover when they turn up at their stations to get to Edinburgh they're getting trains that are unrefurbished, nearly 50 years old. I mean, c c can you see why there, there's a sense of frustration amongst uh, passengers in that respect? I mean, I think it's fair to say we share customers' frustration that delays by Webtech and Angel trains as less as in this situation. Uh, but nevertheless, we want to deliver the more seats, uh, the more services and the faster journeys for customers and that we will start next month. I mean, I would add that the customer feedback we've had based on the intercity train which we've uh, already introduced has exceeded the level of customer feedback we've received are the brand new Hitachi trains, which kind of demonstrates that, um, you know, providing the customer environment is of high quality. 
um, the age of the train is not a material um, consideration in the minds of the customer. Okay, and Richard Lyle, yours is the next Thank question. Thank you, Kandina. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of members of the committee were in Glasgow, and we had the opportunity, I, I had the opportunity of, of walking through uh, Glasgow Queen Street, which is being refurbished and undergoing substantial re de redevelopment, principally to allow increased passenger circulation space. Can you, I, I spoke to two workers while I was there, can I ask you this question, I don't think you've ever you've been asked. I was surprised that one of them worked for an agency, but he had a ScotRail uh, jumper on. So do you have any agency workers working for ScotRail? And can you provide an update on the redevelopment of Glasgow Queen Street Station? Yeah, sure. So we do have some agency workers working for ScotRail uh, to fill short-term uh, gaps in our staffing uh, or, or to deal with um, an increase in demand. So, for example, if we've got special events or in the run-up to Christmas, we bring in additional um, short-term agency uh, people to support our teams on the ground. Uh, obviously, as a living wage employer, we make sure that all our staff in ScotRail and indeed those people in our supply chain are paid the Scottish living wage. And we've got a huge recruitment campaign going on across Scotland's railway right now. 200 people in Network Rail Scotland, 140 people in ScotRail to um, accommodate growing demand for great people to supply the bigger and better railway that we're creating here. In terms of the Queen Street redevelopment, uh, we've now completed the demolition of the 1970s buildings which uh, were in front of the uh, Victorian train shed onto George Square. Um, we've now commenced the creation of the brand new, fully accessible modern concourse which is gonna bring the railway into the heart of George Square. Uh, that project is on time and on budget. It will deliver eight car platforms by December next year, which will enable us to lengthen the Edinburgh Glasgow services from seven carriages to eight carriages from December next year. Um, and the complete station will be finished in the spring of 2020. You've just asked my, answered my second question, but can I also say just if, uh, quickly, uh, the two people I spoke to spoke highly of Scott Rail, and I, uh, they were hoping that they would get a full-time job, mm. so I hope they do. Yeah. I wish them well. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, I'm going to bring in on a slightly different subject, but on stations, Colin. Um, if you'd Thank you very much, Convener. Services, obviously, from Air Station have been severely disrupted since um, August, including the cancellation of all southbound services between Air and Stranraer. Very welcome. Some of those services were reinstated on the 2nd of November, but when can we expect all southbound services to be reinstated? And given the fact that the problems at Air Station are not going to go away uh, and further work will be required at that station, can you give a guarantee that you're developing a contingency plan that will see a temporary station opened south of air should there be disruption in the future? So, um, like you, we were pleased to see the reinstatement of train services through to Stranra, and we had a meeting of the Air uh, Station Task Force just yesterday, and all parties reiterated their commitment, our desire to see the reinstatement of a full service as soon as possible. Uh, we don't yet have a firm date on that, because we're still understanding what works need to be taken to the former station hotel building to make sure we can protect the railway and get the full functionality that we need, particularly access to our air town head depot. So all parties, Transport Scotland, ScotRail, Network Rail Scotland, South Ayrshire Council, are working as fast as we possibly can to reinstate the full train service as soon as possible and also in parallel work up a plan for the longer term future of the station and to make sure that if we have to go in and do any further works, any further stabilisation or encapsulation works at that station, that it's not uh, too disruptive to the train service. Okay. Um, Stuart, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we've probably covered a fair bit of this because I wanted just to ask about uh, what's happening on Stirling, Dunblane and Alloa. And we, 
in your answers to uh, my colleague John Long, the, the John Mason, uh, you gave some answers. I'm just looking at uh, some of the uh, diagrams for the new timetable, and I see for Edinburgh to Dunblane, it is pathed as a 158, but your answer said it's a 365. Is that simply because the 365 performance characteristics have been treated as a 158, or is it act? I'm looking at the 10th of December, uh, service one, Papa, two, three. Um, okay. Well, it was my understanding that we've uh, diagrammed electric trains on that route. Um, um, we're still working through the fine detail of our timetable, but in terms of the electrification of uh, the railway between uh, Falkirk and Stirling Dunblane, Allowa, the construction phase is now complete. Uh, we have now started to what's called energise the railway, which is essentially to switch the electricity on. And um, overnight, each night at the moment, we are in the process of making sure that the construction is such that we can start to run test trains. We will start to run test trains at the end of this month, and that will enable us to make sure that the system of electrification is performing as we expect. And then we can hand the railway into use to operate electric trains on that route from the 9th of December. So it's my expectation we're operating electric trains on the railway between uh, Falkirk, Grahamston and Stirling Dunblane Alloa from the 9th of December. Uh, the pathing for Glasgow Queen Street to Alloa is showing 385s, which I presume therefore the engineering and proving is complete on that route. Is that what that's telling you? Yeah, I'll need to clarify that. Um, I'm happy to take that offline and uh, respond to your question in writing. And, and looking at the pathing from Edinburgh to Cumbernauld via Grahamston, it's also pathed as 385s. So yes. is the engineering complete on that as well? So, so yeah, for, for December, so the electrification of the line between Edinburgh and Glasgow by Volker Grahamston is complete and in use. From December, we operate a brand new service, which is Edinburgh to Glasgow via Falkirk, Grahamston. And in addition, the services to Dunblane, Stirling and Alloa all convert to electric operation from the 9th of December. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is John Mason. Continuing that theme, could you give us an update on the shots line and, and the electrification of it? Yes, of course. Um, on shots, um, so we've now had authorisation from the rail regulator to say that this is a piece of infrastructure which we can use, and the east end of the shots line electrification has now been energised and is fit for service. We're hoping to complete the west side of the shots line project uh, next month. Um, the Shots Line electrification doesn't actually drive a timetable change for December. It's not December dependent. But both the Stirling Dunblane Alloa electrifications and the Shots Line electrification are due to complete next month. And both of those projects will be delivered within our budgeted borrowing headroom. And actually, both of those projects are due to beat the regulatory milestone for the electrification of those lines, which was March next year. We expect to complete both in uh, December of this year. So does that mean you, although they're not in the timetable, do you when do you start using the electric trains on the shorts line then? Do you think? So, so not in December, no. but between December and May. Before May. And we're right. currently working through, you know, what's the fastest possible way we can give customers the benefit of electric trains. Clearly that requires Hitachi to deliver no, uh, no, in no. excess of the 30 we need for next month's timetable change. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the next question is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, can you give us an update on phase two of the Highland... Oh, sorry, sorry. That, can I, I'm going to pause because I did actually say to Rich Lyle I was going to bring him in on that question. Oh. So, for it's, for it's safe, just a, Richard Lyle getting, getting... A quick cut general out. question. That quite a lot of uh, rail track is, is near hand to uh, houses. What, what action, when you're up... To, upgrading a station or a platform, what action do you take to ensure that uh, residents are not getting too inconvenienced by the noise, especially during the night? Yeah, 
exactly. Mm -hmm. So, as you might imagine, given the scale of the investment happening on Scotland's railway network, often overnight, um, making sure we conduct that work in a way which is, um, you know, takes cognizance of line side neighbours uh, is really, really important to us. And we have a specific team to manage those community impacts. So, the first thing that we do is make sure that line side neighbours are aware that work is going to take place. So, we inform them and uh, the amount of communication activity happening right across Scotland's rail network in terms of community liaison is, is very high as you might imagine and then we make sure that our contractors and our workforce understand the sensitivity of the work that they're doing particularly overnight so um, inevitably in some cases there is some disruption um, in the short term but it's our job to make sure we're managing that work as delicately as possible. Um, I might add that on the electrification schemes, of course, once constructed, because electric trains are quieter than diesel trains, the noise um, impacts of the railway are actually significantly reduced. So whilst there might be some short-term impacts, we have to manage sensitively at the end of the day with an electric railway, it's quieter than a diesel one. Thank you. Right, sorry, I apologise. Uh, Gail, for interrupting you. Sorry, Gail. Apology accepted. Um, so, Highland Main Line Phase Two. Can we get an update, please? Yes, of course. So, we are currently on site upgrading the Highland Main Line. So, we have a £60 million project which is due to finish at the end of March, which will see us adjust uh, the infrastructure on the Highland Main Line to enable us to operate a regular hourly service between the Highlands and the Central Belt and also cut journey time in due course once we've completed the rollout of the intercity trains. So, that investment, £60 million, uh, due to complete by the end of March. We are currently on site and that's going well and that will unlock the faster journeys and the more seats and the more services we'll provide at future timetable changes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned faster journeys. In your opening statement, you mentioned scenic rural journeys and because um, the convener's going to let me off with this one. The far north line, obviously, mm -hmm. journey times from Inverness to Wick are four and a half hours. That's lovely if you want to take in the scenery, but not so great if you want to get somewhere quickly. So what work is being undertaken to try and cut that journey time? So, I mean, I think there's two specific areas on journey time I want to pick up on. One is a generic one. Across Scotland's railway network, we're working hard on journey time. Both ScotRail and now Network Rail Scotland has specific targets to improve journey times on Scotland's railway, both for passengers and for freight. Uh, and we have a team uh, working on that uh, to make sure we're maximising uh, any opportunities. And then specifically on the Far North Line, obviously we have the review group, which is ongoing, which is um, assessing the ideas that we might have to cut journey time and that might see us amend stopping patterns, add additional services in with limited stops to try and reflect the fact that the visitor economy isn't the only market we're serving in those areas. Okay, thanks. Uh, John Finney. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thanks for these answers, Mr Haynes. Um, £60 million pounds is a significant investment and it's, it's very welcome. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, it will still leave the greater part of the, the route between the central belt of Perth and, um, and Inverness a single track. And SOS law guarantees if a locomotive is going to break down, as has happened a number of times, it's going to break down in the single line section of it. Now, uh, the most recent Network Rail Monitor Scotland and the ORR uh, highlight the concerns about timetabling and, and opportunities for freight. Is it the case that with the introduction of the developments at Aviemore and Pitlochry, <coughs> excuse me, and the new high-speed trains. Are some of the train times actually going to be longer than they are at the moment? And are there any implications for knock-on for people travelling beyond Inverness, please? So our expectation is that we will cut journey times as a result of Highland Main Line. One of the reasons why we haven't been actually specific around uh, exact journey times is we need to work with other train operating companies and freight operating companies because we have ambitious targets for freight growth as well and we are developing the timetable uh, across Scotland's railway industry to come up with the best possible solution for passengers and freight but both for passenger journeys and for freight journeys uh, we've got clear targets to meet to cut journey times for both. 
But you would acknowledge there's a significant impact on the proportion of the line that remains single track, notwithstanding these welcome upgrades. Yeah, I mean, the, the current investment programme will improve uh, the ability of the infrastructure to support better train services, but as you say, single track sections will remain, which inevitably constrain our ability to grow the train service even further. And if you've done any evaluation of the increased, and again, welcome increase in the movement of trains, and the potential implications, because as, as you'll be aware, or as, as the Deputy Convener and myself are well aware, it's often not that you're held at once. If there is a problem, it can sometimes be three delays in the, in the line going yeah. on. So we're expecting these infrastructure interventions to enable a more reliable railway. And of course, with the deployment of the intercity trains and their better uh, capability, acceleration, braking and quality, customers can look forward to enable by the Howland Mainline project faster journeys, more seats and more services. That's what we're committed to delivering for people. Okay, with regard to the scenic routes and, and uh, a lot of the uh, West Highland lines, uh, are they being viewed in, in these terms there? I understand there's to be an increased frequency on a Sunday for That's instance to, to La Haber, which yeah. is welcome. Yeah. Which I'll then run into one further question, which applies across the network, and that is a lot of that um, additional capacity is generated by um, people who are involved in mountain biking, for instance. Yeah. And I think you know where I'm going with this. The, yeah undertakings between Glasgow and Edinburgh about the, yeah. the, the level of um, cycles that would be carried, the upgrading and the issues around the weight of the door and what could be carried in the refurbished high-speed trains, mm -hmm. because there was a big expectation and of course all very well having an increased service on a Sunday, but if you can still only fit two or three bikes on, it's not going to make much. Yeah. So we're continuing to invest in the scenic rail journeys, so that's refurbishing rolling stock to uh, enable more scenic light layouts, so that's lining seats up with windows, for example, which we've done on the Class 158 rolling stock and we are doing on the intercity rolling stock. And next year you'll see us launch more and more of these scenic rail journeys and actively uh, promote those uh, as we refurbish more of the stock. Um, clearly, um, cycle carriage uh, is a big challenge. The fact that we're getting more carriages up from 800 carriages in the fleet to 1,000 in the future will give us more space for everybody, uh, including cyclists. Um, we're working specifically with Scottish Government on a plan for the scenic lines, which would see us hiring additional carriages, which we could use for uh, the carriage of cycles and heavy uh, mountain biking equipment and we're hoping to be able to launch something there for next summer and then specifically on the intercity trains we have a investment program to increase the number of bikes which are available to be stored in the carriages uh, and that modification is underway and also once all the longer distance services are operated by intercity trains we will enable uh, customers to store their bikes in the end power cars which exist on these intercity trains for end-to-end -end journeys so people going from the the start of the train service to the end clearly we can't launch that until uh, we've got all the high-speed trains into traffic because we wouldn't want to uh, promise customers a high-speed train one way and then not be able to catch them back. So um, we've got an investment programme for cycles both at stations and on board. We have a dedicated cycling manager and making Scotland's railway more convenient for cyclists is a, a key part of our investment programme. Okay, thank you very much. Can you share progress with the committee regarding the, the provision of cycle um, Yes, capacity, of course. Please? Yeah, we're happy to follow that up. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Maureen, I think the next question is yours. Okay, if we can move on to the Aberdeen Inverness uh, upgrade where uh, work is ongoing. I understand that some of the work has come in um, ahead of schedule, particularly um, from Aberdeen to uh, DICE. Can you just give us an update on where this project is and whether the whole project could come in ahead of schedule? I know there's some work pretty major work which will require commuters to use bus services shortly. So um, we're spending 330 million upgrading the Aberdeen to Inverness line which will enable ScotRail to introduce um, more services and quicker journeys and, quick, and, more, and, and, and higher quality services as well. 
And not only are we focused on making sure the service between Aberdeen and Inverness is better, we're also interested in making sure that local rail provision into Inverness is better and uh, local rail provision into Aberdeen is better. So uh, that project is currently on time and on budget. Uh, we decided to do the project using two big closures of the railway. We made that decision in consultation with the public uh, in that part of the country. And the first blockade we had was a 14-week blockade earlier on this year to reinstate double track uh, between Aberdeen and Dice. And I'm pleased to say that that project went well. We delivered all the work we expected in that, uh, in that period and the rail replacement operation worked well and that railway has operated reliably since we handed it back into service. The, the next phase of the project sees us another block uh, next spring into the autumn where we do similar as we reinstate more double track and the full benefits of the Aberdeen to Inverness upgrade will be felt by customers in the December of next year. So more services, better quality rolling stock. Obviously, the service will be more reliable because there will be less single track sections between Aberdeen and Inverness. Okay, thank you. Um, and Jamie, I think you've got a question. Thank, thank you, Convener. I appreciate uh, you indulging me. Um, I recently asked in the, the chamber uh, uh, the Scottish Government's plans for improving disabled access to uh, stations and carriages. Uh, the answer somewhat pointed me in the direction of Network Rail and that I should be lobbying them, but can you provide some reassurances that actually there's a joined up approach between both governments and all uh, members of the Alliance that there is actually a, a, a will and a plan to improve uh, disability access uh, across the network? Accessibility of rail services is right up there at the top of our agenda. The good news about Scott Rail Services is um, there's always at least two people on board each train who, who can support customers who require some additional help. Um, every single carriage in the rolling stock fleet will be fully accessible to people with reduced mobility by the end of next year. Every time we go in and make a station investment, Queen Street being a good example, Richard, uh, we make sure it's fully accessible and we're currently working with Transport Scotland to make sure we can uh, exploit the access for all funding pot which exists across the UK to improve station accessibility. So, um, you know, we have a dedicated accessibility uh, manager. We have have a forum uh, who help us design products and services. So uh, to give you an example, the accessibility forum were the first people to try out our new intercity train uh, and they were really pleased with the accessibility improvements that we've made and um, some people may have noticed the change priority seating which we've made on express to make sure the priority uh, seating is really clear um, the people we work with um, uh, representing accessibility groups say that's absolutely fantastic and really helps people with additional needs and we're looking to see whether we can roll that out on the other fleet. So it's absolutely the top of our agenda. Um, that sparked two more questions. Uh, John <laughs> Finney, followed by Richard Lam. Hey, thank you, Convener. I, I certainly commend the, the uh, priority seating on the trains. I think it's, it's excellent, and I've seen a lot of uh, favourable comment about it on social media. If I noted you correctly, Mr. Hines, you said there's always at least two people on board a train. This is, this is very welcome news. Uh, um, and and uh, um, yeah. Is, so, is, this a, is this a big announcement today? Is it? So, I mean, obviously, on the driver only, driver only operation bits of the network, uh, which tend to be in the Glasgow uh, metro area, uh, we're committed to providing a ticket examiner on board each service, and this is an area we've been working really hard on now. And um, you know, nearly every service uh, which operates now has at least two members on board, and it's one area which we've been working really hard on. And help me, um, how does that work? The, the ticket collector staying on the train all the time from start to finish? Yes, train? correct. So um, as part of our franchise agreement and as part of the agreement we have with our trade union partners, we're committed to providing a ticket examiner on board the driver only operated services, which as I say are mainly in the Strathclyde area. And that's an area which we've been seeing really great progress on recently. But of course, a ticket examiner is not the same as a highly trained safety critical guard. Uh, the, the role is different. 
the role is different, but nevertheless, from a customer perspective, um, they like to see helpful, visible, uh, highly trained employees, and that's what we um, set out to deliver. And we've been working really hard in this area to make sure that no matter where you are across Scotland's railway network, you see a consistent level of onboard visibility for our people. Well, that's very reassuring. Again, could you share the rollout of that? programme with the committee. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, Rich Lyle, uh, which will be the last question, and I've got a point of clarification. Uh, if the convener allows me, there's one question you've, you've not been asked during the session is on ticket prices. Mm -hmm. could, could ticket prices be made more uh, accessible as in, as in, you know, booking in advance? You know, if you book in advance, you can possibly get a deal if you want to go to Aberdeen or whatever. You know, is there any way of uh, rationalising making this more simple for people? People like me who like to go on trains? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't get out your five cards on this question. Um, but, so, <laughs> so um, uh, obviously the fares and ticketing system um, is uh, a complex one across the UK. Yeah, because you've got to we, make a profit. I, I know you have to make a yeah. profit. But so so our, our job is to try and make it as simple uh, for customers to understand, which is one reason why we're investing in smart ticketing. So our advice to customers, if you, if you want the very best deal, make sure you buy before you board. That's the first thing. Buy in advance if you can. And uh, we make sure that we offer really good value fares to our customers because ultimately uh, one of the ways we will be successful is to making sure that um, the additional capacity which we're providing in terms of the number of seats are filled with customers so they can enjoy our product. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alex, I, I'd like a, to ask a, a point to be clarified. I, I was one of the committee members that went to Glasgow Queen Street station and, and saw the work that was going there. Now, when you came to the committee on the 8th of May, you said that the redevelopment of Glasgow Queen Street station completion date is 2020. Now, when you said to the committee today, you said it would be completed in December 2020. Can I just have clarification? I think that's what you said. So, um, the eight car platforms will be delivered by December of next year. Um, the station um, concourse redevelopment will be complete by spring of 2020. Uh, so, so, OK, everything will be complete by the spring of 2020. That, that is the end date for the redevelopment of Glasgow Queen Street Station, yes. Thank you. I'm grateful for that, and, and I'm sure you'll be back in before then to... to, to um, answer that if necessary. Thank you very much for the evidence session you've given this morning. There are no further questions, so I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow the witnesses to depart. <coughs> Thank you.
Uh, we're now moving back into session and we're going to move on to agenda item four, which is the European Union Withdrawal Act. This is consideration of Scottish Government's proposals to consent to the UK Government legislating on three statutory instruments. We have received consent notices notifications in relation to the following UK SIs. The Exotic Disease Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018, the Aquatic Animal Health and Alien and Locally Absent Species in Aquaculture, Aquaculture Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. <clears throat> Sorry, let's see if this one comes out better. The Fisheries Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019. These instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act. All three have been categorised by the Scottish Government as making minor or technical amendments. The Committee's role is to decide whether it agrees to the Scottish Government giving consent to the UK Government to make regulations on its behalf. Uh, there are some committee's papers, there are some broader related policy issues which may arise in the future. Um, and we've all had a chance to go through it, and I could go on and explain each and every one, but my, my question really is, are there any comments on, on the SIs? Uh, John, you'd like to make a brief one. Um, thank you. I have no issue with the content uh, of them at all, and I think it's appropriate that we lend our support. It was just simply in relation to the, the comment, um, the paragraph covering summary of stakeholder engagement and consultation, mm -hmm. it says there, and I quote, the Scottish Government speaks frequently with a broad range of stakeholders to discuss animal health and welfare-related matters. Now, I don't doubt that, but given the wealth of, or the, 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 the amount of legislation that's coming, it would be very good to know that specifically these uh, issues have been drawn to the attention of, of the normal consultees. Okay. I, th I think that's a genuine point, and I think it would be helpful that uh, we ask the government to clarify when these are brought forward that they have consulted with the interested parties. Uh, Stuart. Um, given that this is the Scottish Parliament giving consent to the UK Parliament, then, of course, the consultation would properly lie with the UK. Um, I think it would still be comfortable to know that they've, be, they've been discussed, and, and we can leave that to the government to make sure that we, we've raised that point. Are there any other comments? Okay, so uh, the question is, is the committee agreed that it should write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for these UK SIs to be given? Uh, is a, uh, oh, sorry, and the committee agreed that it should note and request a response from the Scottish Government on the related policy matters identified in the paper, which will re be required to be addressed in the future. Agreed. Okay, so that is agreed. Therefore, uh, that concludes the uh, public part of the meeting, and the committee will now move into private.